morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. This is the Excellence in Praise and Worship class. This is Lesson 3.3, In the Name of the Lord. Uh, the class is in the name of the Lord, and also the class is in the name of the Lord. Like that, that works both ways. Anyway, I'm glad to have you all here this morning. Um, it is that really kind of cruddy time of the year when your heat's coming on in the house at night and it dries everything out. So I've been crushing a couple of halls this morning and drinking water. Hopefully I don't sound terrible. If I do, or if I get a little scratchy, forewarned. Um, not sickness, just dry air. I don't like it. All right, so anyway, glad to have you all here this morning. Again, we'll uh, get into this lesson. We don't have very many lessons left. So as always, I appreciate that you've paid attention, that you've uh, interacted during class, shared your thoughts and questions with one another. It makes the class so much better uh, for a teacher. It makes it better for the students as well. So I appreciate that. Uh, before we get into the class, let's have a word of prayer together, please. Our Holy Father, we are blessed every day, and we are especially blessed on the first day of the week when we gather as a congregation of your people, as a body that will exclaim your goodness and your mercy to the world, that will exclaim your son's death and the importance of it uh, as long as we draw breath. We pray that that's our mission. We pray that we uh, wake up every day thinking about how blessed we are to have that opportunity Knowing that we have a relationship with you through Christ changes everything for us. And as we come into a study, we pray that that's in our minds, that we have gratitude, uh, and so that we approach the study of your word with zeal and anticipation. We pray that this church do goes about its work, that it takes it seriously, that it um, appreciates that it has an opportunity to seek and save the lost that we grow in love for people, not just people who think like us, act like us, dress like us, or look like us, but all people, because your son died for all of us. Father, we thank you for the love that you give to us, the mercy you have on us, and the grace that's bestowed upon us. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I mentioned this is Lesson 3.3. Do you have a microphone? Oh, yes, thank you for that reminder. <laughs> Ryan's like trying to use sign language with me, and I'm like dense. I'm like, you have a microphone? If you have a question <laughs> uh, and you need a microphone, raise your hand. If you've got a short, you know, a few word question or a comment, you can just raise your hand and blurt that out, and I'll be glad to repeat it onto the microphone. If it's a little bit longer, then just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, there is just one microphone for the entire auditorium, so be patient. We'll get to you. Ryan is, is swift, but not as swift as he was 10 years ago, so he'll go as fast as he can. All right. <laughs> like I can talk. All right, so, um, again, the, last, the title of this lesson is In Jesus' Name. And in this lesson today, what I want us to do is think about what does that mean. We've talked about that a little bit already in some previous lessons. So this is not going to be something brand new. Uh, we've touched on it. What do we do in Jesus' name? And then, when is it appropriate? When is it appropriate to say that we're doing something in Jesus' name or not? So we're going to look at all those things uh, today throughout this class. And we're going to start in the book of Colossians, in chapter 3, and read verses 12 through 17. Again, we've read this in previous classes, too. But we'll look at it a little bit differently today. So Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, I read from the ESV. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones... Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In these verses, in this passage, I think it breaks down pretty neatly into a couple or maybe three different sections. And in the first couple verses, verse 12 and 13, it's really talking about our interpersonal behavior, how we get along with one another. Um, we can spend an awful lot of time thinking about that, meditating on that, and just working on self-improvement. 
Uh, how we treat one another is crucial, uh, not only to how the church you know, gets along and, and stays unified, but also to the cause of Christ. It is very difficult, nearly impossible, for us to offer hope to the world if we don't get along with each other. We can't go out into the world and say, we have the message you need to hear, but don't listen to my brother who goes to church with me because he's an idiot. We can't do that for obvious reasons, right? Amen. <laughs> I don't know if you're amening the brother being an idiot or the unity. <laughs> no, no, Jim says amen. I know what he means. Uh, for us to be effective, we have to be unified. Uh, verses 14 and 15, love is the bond. And when you think about that, that makes an awful lot of sense. When we talk about needing to get along with one another and work well together, we must have love. 1 Corinthians 13 applies very well here. You know, how we treat one another is predicated on do we love one another and is that love active for one another? And then there is this phrase that the, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know, there, there's an awful lot of distraction in the world. Jim talks about this really often, and he's, he's right to do so. There's a lot of things that can distract us from our service to God, from the importance of our interpersonal relationships, from our worship. And oftentimes it's because there's some sort of turmoil that's caught our attention. Um, I, I do not, I, a lot of people say they don't watch the news. I dabble in the news, um, but I don't go down the rabbit hole. I, I try not to let the news overtake what I'm thinking about because it's very easy, right? Because you turn the news on, you turn on the news on this morning, we're talking about a new variant of the, of the coronavirus, we're talking about school shootings, we're talking about politics, we're talking, I mean, you know, all that stuff. Are all those things important? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, in different ways they are. But what they do is they get us upset. They, they put us in this, in this little personal tempest. And they rob us of the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ says, think about eternal things. Be, uh, and I've said this phrase in here before, be an eschatological people, a people who think about the end times. Because that is when God is in all in all. That is when all, this, all of our salvation is complete the already not yet eschatology that Paul talks about. That's when that happens, at the end. And there's so many things that pull us away from that, distract us from that. Hello. Two quick comments. Uh, first is the old expression that says, uh, from one of my sales days, is we have more to fear from internal incompetence than we do outside competition. And in our case, uh, we're not going to be able to take on Satan and, and battle him because he, there are powers battling the church that we can't see. And we're not going to be able to do that if we're not if we're not on our best game, so to speak. All right. Another thing, one thing I always say in class uh, to students is they'll talk about news and things. I said the purpose of news is to sell advertising. Period. That's their purpose is to get ratings, sell advertising. I said so they're going to blow that up. I said that's why you need to be turning to God at all points. That's why we need to be looking at the Bible because God's in control. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, again, I don't advocate you stick your head in the sand, and I don't think LR is either. Um, but also recognize there's a purpose for what they're doing. Um, news is entertainment, and that's weird, but that's, that's what it is. All right, again, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole either, so I'm going to stop myself. All right, in verse 16, he starts talking about what we do in worship. Let the word of, word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this isn't just in like our assembled worship, but I, I think it applies. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. So there again, we're, now we're thinking, we're shifting from interpersonal relationships to the thing that bonds that and the peace that we have with, the, with one another and with God. And then we go into how we act in worship, what drives us there. And then, so that makes me think, because we have shifted into worship, that verse 17 is applies much more so to that to worship to our wisdom and our, our singing psalms and hymns spiritual songs we read verse 17 and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him so I think that's where we start this morning is that idea is recognizing that I do think that obviously we, we do not compartmentalize we do not act like what we do here 
is just a part of us and we leave that part here and we go out into the world. That is wrong. and We all know that. But I think specifically verse 17 is talking about what you do in worship, what you do in service to God, literal service to God then I think that is done with the authority of Jesus. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about being in the name of Jesus. So let's, let's start with the most obvious. Where, where do we hear that phrase, in Jesus' name? At the end of a prayer. So let's start with prayer. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 14. And let's read there. John 14, and we're going to read verses 12 through 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What stands out to you in, that, in those verses? What does Jesus say? Who's coming after Jesus, by the way? Well, we are, right? Specifically, maybe immediately, the apostles were, but the church is going to be established. So we're part of that. So we're following Jesus. And what does Jesus say about who follows him? What are they going to do? Right. Yeah, and that's exactly it, Matt. He, we're going to do, he, whoever's coming after Jesus is going to do greater works than Jesus. And as Matt said, I find that hard to grasp, and I think I agree with you. That is really hard to comprehend. So I'm going to give you my, uh, my interpretation. Not just my interpretation, I studied. Um, other people smarter than me helped me with this interpretation. First of all, let's see what Jesus says. Jesus says, I am going to the Father, is what he says. So... I think that's the key, because the whole pendulum here swings on that. Look at that again. He says, um, greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. What happens when Jesus goes to the Father? What predicated that? Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means Jesus goes to the Father, and that unlocks whatever these greater things are. So now let's, let's just go through some critical thinking. What is possible now that Jesus has died for our sins, was buried, and has been resurrected? What's possible for you now that wasn't possible before that? Salvation. Being saved from our sins. Being delivered from our guilt and the consequence of it. What else? Yeah, yeah, the access to salvation is not limited. It is wide open. Anyone can do this. Anyone can do this, just whether or not they choose to. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to say it. A comprehensive understanding of God's expectations. How do we have that? Because we have this, right? We have this comprehensive understanding of God's expectations, as Jim says, because... The Holy Spirit has revealed so much more to the apostles and the writers, and they wrote it down, and it's preserved for us. So now we have this deeper understanding of the entire thing. Does Matt want to make a comment or not? I couldn't tell. I'll make it. Okay, go ahead. Then. He walked all the way over here, so. Um, <laughs> but there, there is the idea uh, also that due to Christ dying and leaving, going back to heaven, we now have the Holy Spirit and everything that that entails. So. Yeah, I think that, that's great. Uh, and and this is two slides, we're going to talk about that. But yes, that's true. So we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and inspires the writers. The writers write it down. Um, I think there's a whole lot more to the Holy Spirit, but not in this class. I'm going to talk about that. Um, so Jesus says two things. He says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We also now have access to the Father. Right? We have salvation, we have understanding, 
We have hope. There's an awful lot of things that are unlocked in this. We have relationship. We also have access to the Father. We take things to God. What in the world could we take to God that he's incapable of dealing with? Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing in this creation that is beyond his grasp. That is why when you read the book of James, James is admonishing us and and encouraging us, pray with expectation. Don't pray with doubt. Do you know who you're talking to? So Jesus gives us that. So when when we're in Jesus' name, when we pray in Jesus' name, we approach God the Father, the supreme, the the creator, the sustainer, the all-powerful, with the authority of his Son. And how much authority did Jesus have? Yep. Yes. All authority was given to him, and he says, use it. He tells us as his followers, as believers, as his disciples, Use my authority. Approach the Father. Tell him what you need to tell him. And last week when we talked about that, we said be open, be candid, be vulnerable with the Father. Tell him anything you need to tell him. It doesn't mean he's going to give you every single thing that you want. And we don't have that expectation. But he's going to give you what you need. John, do you need a microphone? Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to turn it around on you, John. Why do you not think that he's going to give it to you? So, you know, but the question is, why do, why do we doubt? Why do we pray to God and not think that he's going to listen? Um, and it always makes me think of the old um, Postal Service PSAs that they used to have, warning you about scams coming through the mail. What did they always say? They used to say, it sounds too good to be true. It probably is. And I think sometimes when I consider this grand bargain that I have with God, it sounds too good to be true. Because it doesn't make any sense from his perspective. Why in the world would he give me anything? What have I done to deserve any of this? Nothing. Not a thing. (laughs) But yet, because of his benevolence, because of his goodness, he does that. All right, I need to move on. Let's look at a couple chapters over in John chapter 16. Here are verses 16 through 24. Jesus says, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will, see, you will see me. So some of the disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does this mean by a little, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Very easy to be sympathetic with the apostles here. If you think about Jesus telling you that, where you're sitting, you're like, What? And that's what they're doing. They're looking at each other and going, what in the world is he talking about? Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers that anguish. For joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. I ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So again, death, burial, resurrection language. Jesus says, he's going to the Father. A little while and you won't see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. 
That's very clear to us on this side of the cross. We get to look backwards. We have that benefit. And we say, oh, clearly he's talking about his resurrection. The apostles said, clearly we have no idea what he's talking about. Even when Jesus explains it to them, they don't really understand what he's talking about. But that's the language. It's the death, burial, resurrection language, just like we saw in chapter 14. So now we see it here in chapter 16. And again, similar language. He says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. What should we ask for? You have to give an answer because I have to take a drink of water. What should we ask for? <laughs> godly things. That's a very generic answer, Gary. You have to do better than that. <laughs> what kind of godly things? Well, how to raise my children. How to raise your children. Spencer, did you have something? Spencer, you have to, I'm sorry, you have to wait. Like three, two, one. Oh, there we go. Uh, in James uh, 4, you know, he says you ask and you do not receive because you're asking to spend it on your own desire. So I think, uh, you know, we have to give thought to what we're asking. It has to be in accordance with God's, God's will. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's, Carrie, that's what you're saying too. Um, and I'm sorry I'm picking on you. <laughs> Hold on, James. We're going to get you a microphone. But I think that, that is very important uh, for us to be asking things in Jesus' name. We're going to think about what that means. Go ahead, James. I, th I think it would help us to appreciate the fact that the apostles struggled with this as well, even after the resurrection, even after the ascension. In Acts chapter 2, they're speaking in tongues, and they're recognizing that this is that. The Holy Spirit has poured out, been poured out on us. And then in Acts chapter 3, the first recorded miracle, other than the divine giving of the Holy Spirit, the languages... Peter reaches out and heals a man. And I think that was a leap of faith in a sense for Peter because he hadn't done it before. He says, I don't have any money, but I, here's what I do have. Took him up and said, stand up and walk. And pulled the man up and you know, literally reached out, grabbed him and pulled him up. Yeah. That was faith. That was asking God in faith to do something that he didn't really know that he could do other than because he trusted in God. And it gets back to that's something that is focused on what will benefit God by bringing glory to him through this, uh, the, the uh, healing of this man. And that gets into that, the asking godly things and not the world things of this world. We are so caught up in this world. We're so caught up in possessions. We're so caught up in health. We're so caught up in everything on this world. And we get so focused on that. Are we praying for the expansion of the kingdom and the expansion of God's word through giving up things and thinking more about what God would want and doing it therefore in his name yeah very good I, you're right we are so entangled with the worldly things and sometimes when we say well I'm just going to pray for godly things it's really hard to identify them because we've got everything so intermingled it's really difficult for us to say all right this I don't need this is not something that glorifies God this is that takes some mental exercise and a lot of times frankly we're not willing to do that but we really ought to all right, let's, uh, let's move on here. Oh, Brad, go ahead. Oh, I, have a, I have problems with this, <laughs> realizing that Jesus is God on foot. You know, he's, he is God, came down here with us, and he has the power. In, in the, that 16th chapter of John, on down in verse 30, it says now we know and that's pointing back to verse 19. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. You know, they were struggling with that too. We still do too. Uh, realizing that he does have the power uh, to, to do those things. And, and we do. We get caught up in, you know... Surely we're not praying for us to win the ball game, you know, those types of things. And that's hard because we're humans. We, we really are. That's yeah. all I'll say. <laughs> no, I, think that, I think that's great. Um, and again, we, we, we try not to pray for frivolous things. And, and what I appreciate about what you said, Brad, is it reminds me to say this. God gives you grace. Give yourself some. You know, whenever you pray for something, and, and then later you're like, ah, you know, that was really selfish. I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Forgive yourself. God doesn't expect you to nail all this. He doesn't expect you to get it all 100% right. We need to lean on him. Travis, back to what John said, too. He answered his own question. He, 
in one statement that he made, when he asked God, he said these words. John said, not John in the Bible, but John over here. Yeah, John Bunch over yeah. here. Uh, he said, as he sees fit, that's our answer. Yeah, very good. All right, Matthew 27, uh, verses 50 and 51. Continuing this thought about uh, in Jesus' name in prayer. Uh, again, in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 50. Is that right? Yes, it is. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. One of the more uh, impressive and, and interesting images that we read about during the crucifixion is this. That when Jesus dies, at the moment Jesus dies, the veil of the temple is torn in what direction? And that is important. It's who's closest to the top. I mean, that, that veil was tall. No one was grabbing a seam and just, you know, running with it. It's torn from top to bottom. That imagery is important because it tells us it is access is given to the holiest of all from, because God has given his son. Jesus is the key to unlocking that. So his death, burial, and resurrection gives us access to the Father, and this changes everything. We have new power in prayer. We have new intimacy in relationship. We have new hope for eternity. And as uh, Matt was talking about, that, that Greek word, and I brought it up in here before, and I'm sorry for butchering the Greek words, you know, give me grace too, okay? <laughs> I'm no Curtis Pope. I can't say all those things properly. Uh, He's a parakletos. Jesus is the parakletos, the one called to our side. And that, but when Jesus is the parakletos, when that word is assigned to him in 1 John, it's talking about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father. He is up there representing us, the Holy Spirit. The other being that that term parakletos is used for is now here. That's what Jesus says when he says, the helper will come, my Father will send you aid. It's that word, parakletos. And so the Holy Spirit comes to us to be our aid. So Matt's right. One of the things that we gain by Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, is the Holy Spirit being given to us in a really new and powerful way. And in the meantime, Jesus is at God's right hand saying, I've walked as a human, I understand, I sympathize with these people, I'm here to make their case, which we don't deserve. And as Jesus isn't up there making excuses for us, he's taking the blame for us. He's taking the guilt for us. It's all our fault. All right, so in Jesus' name, more, it, it's more than this holy passphrase. I don't want you to think that your, that your prayer is, is sitting here waiting to get past this, this locked door to get to God. And we say, in Jesus' name, and a key opens the door. That's not what this is about. But to remain with this access to him, we have to remain in Jesus' authority. We have to remain in a relationship with him. And as uh, Spencer pointed out, James chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Be careful about what you ask for. You need to be willing to ask God for anything that you need, but you need to be mindful about that you're not just asking things that benefit you, things that benefit the kingdom and others. Those are things you need to be asking about. Gerald? Yeah, the context is James 4. Um, and it, it, context is always important here. And he's, he's talking about people with having quarrels and people who are having fighting and people who are murdering and people who are doing some crazy stuff. And, and, and whether or not they're asking to kill somebody or whether or not they're asking something bad to happen to a friend or I, I don't know what they're asking. But he says here, you're, you're asking this on your passions. And it seems like it's angry passions um, from the context here, but I could be wrong. So I think it's important that we think about that. Secondly, I, I really struggle with this. Because even the first passage you read, Jesus said, anything you ask, you ask in my name, have faith. James repeatedly, over and over and over, talks about faith. He says, don't be a person who looks in the mirror and forgets who he is. And we like to surf of the sea. I believe in God one day and I don't the other. If everything is set and we just say, well, Lord, every, every, you do I want everything out there. I'm just going to say one prayer. Um, I, I want everything in your will, and I'm done. 
Well, does that mean we're predestined? Does that mean that everything is already figured out? Does that mean there's nothing up there that we can talk to God and change anything? Or is that, does that not mean there's not discussions? I don't think so. I think God wants us to communicate with him about our lives, things that are going on. He wants us to ask him, communicate, be sincere for change and help. These are the things that I need, Lord. These are the things I need help with. I need you to help me with this. I'm telling you, this is what I need. And, and I've referenced people like Moses. I've referenced other, other people that, that had struggles and disagreed with God and said, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what I need. And God relented and changed his mind multiple times. So I think it's important that we pray with the faith. We pray in Jesus' name, that we pray. We, we pray about all these things. And we have this discussion, an interpersonal relationship with God so that he knows what's going on in our lives. And we have that kind of confidence in him that he can and will help us with those. Yeah, I agree. I'll get this one. Just to, just to piggyback on that, I think a lot of that comes from our growth, our personal growth and our relationship with God. As we mature in our Christian walk, our prayers become, hopefully, less about us mm -hmm. and more about God's will. I, th I think that's true. You know, it, over time, we should be getting closer to being people who are in God's will and, and, and molding our lives to be more like him. Um, so that a prayer that even feels selfish is still within God's will because we've changed. We've moved. David? Well, if we would talk to our friends about the struggles we have and things that we need, we need to be talking to the Lord about them. Uh, th to make him just as close a companion to us as people with that we can see and touch and feel. Uh, Sometimes we may tend to do that and, and uh, leave God out of the equation, but the communicating with him needs to be a habit that we do all the time. You need anything, the little, the smallest thing. That's not too small for the Lord. And if, if we trust him, for resurrection, we ought to be able to trust him for something as small as a meal or a bill or a, some other problem we have. We are trusting him. What motivates us is that we're trusting him for something that is so fantastic it's hard to imagine that he can raise us from the dead. And if he can, if we trust him for that, we should trust him for everything else. I agree, 100%. And... Yeah, and to that end, um, that's what we talked about. We have intimacy with our relationship with, G with God now. Um, and we're, I think he wants that. Like Gerald, I think he wants us to do that. Matt. Yeah, kind of picking up from what Gerald was talking about, those of us that have children, well, at least most of us, we want our children to talk to us. We want our children to communicate with us and share what's in their lives, offer our help if we can. And I can't help but believe that God, as our father, and we as his children, he wants to have that relationship with us. We just one closing thought before we move on from prayer. Do you think God tore that veil of the temple on accident? If God gives us access to come to him through his son, do you think that was a whoops? Oh, or just threw that in at the end? He wants this. He wants this relationship with us. And I think I agree with you. Uh, he wants us to be able to talk to him like that. Johnny. When we pray, we also have a responsibility. And one of the main verses I have for praying comes from Matthew 7, and be beginning with verse 7. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, find. And to him who knocks, it shall be open. Or what man is there among you when his son shall ask for a loaf, you will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Amen. All right. Got to move great way to end it. All right. Uh, 
this idea of being of approaching God or, or, or doing things in Jesus' name, I should say, is more than prayer, right? And that's when we go back to what we read in Colossians chapter 3 already. That whole section in verses 12 through 17 begins with this idea of you being a new self. Do you have a comment? All right, let me finish this sentence because <laughs> um, I've got to speed through this slide. Setting your minds on heavenly things, correcting wrong behavior, recognizing that you are new. Recognizing you're new. You're not just better, you're new. Something totally different than you were before. And this idea of equality within the kingdom we have with one another. Go ahead, Keith. I was just going to say, like, like no other time before Christ, we have a, a unique opportunity after Christ came and died and was resurrected. We've got a ultimate high priest. We've got a sinless high priest that's that's been tempted in every way like we've been. He knows where we're at. Uh, prayer should humble us and it should make us self-examine ourselves. And our prayer life will grow as we get older. We, When we first start our prayer life as individuals, a lot of times it's about me. But when you become a husband or a wife, it changes. When you become a parent, it changes, and when you become a grandparent, mm -hmm. it changes even more. And usually, you find yourself the last person you ask ask for is yourself. You you want to make sure your kids are okay. You want to make sure your grandkids are okay, and it changes your prayer life completely. And it uh, you want to make sure by that self examination, you want to make sure your prayers are being heard, and you have to do a lot of self examination for that to happen. Yeah, and to Keith's point, that responsibility, I like that word. Um, as Christians, as priests, and we've said that in a previous lesson, we are now priests, we're the holy priesthood. We have a responsibility to go to God on behalf of other people. We are moving more toward agape love, serving other people that way. We're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction, and that's what God expects of us. Yeah, yeah, when you get older, Dale says, when you get older and hopefully wiser, you end up thanking God for a lot of unanswered prayers. A lot of things that you thought what you wanted, and you didn't get it, and at the time it hurt, you, go, you look backwards and it's, it was the best thing for you. All right, uh, again, on the idea of more than prayer, thinking about teaching and admonishing one another. Um, let me just say, especially on admonishing one another, you better be doing that in the name of the Lord. Don't be admonishing people trying to change their behavior because they don't do it the way that you want it done. Man, am I preaching it myself. A lot of y'all don't do the stuff I want you to do. <laughs> and don't, don't laugh because y'all all think the same way about people. That's, t that's tough, isn't it? It's hard because you think, oh, I know the best way. You do not. You don't know any better than anybody else does. But that's difficult. And so I think when you talk about teaching and, and admonishing people, it's very important that you recognize why you are doing it, what you are trying to achieve. It's not trying to tweak the church to make it the most pleasing to you. It is trying to help a brother or a sister get closer to God and therefore more glorifying to God and more effective in the kingdom. That's what we ought to be doing. And that comes talking about knowledge and wisdom. It's more than just Bible classes. This ought to be our conversations. Uh, frequently ought to be our conversations. And again, acting in love. That's what maintains the harmony. And I'm going to go really fast now because I got like five minutes. Do you ever think about singing with authority? Well, we do. And this goes back to this concept we again we've talked about a couple of times in this class that we are uniquely qualified to worship God because we are the royal priesthood, because we are spirit filled. Because of those things, we can do these things. We can worship God in a way that the world just simply cannot do yet. Until they put on Christ through baptism uh, and all of those things we talked about before. And again, he says, whatever you do, I do think it applies to things within our worship, the Lord's Supper. But also loving your spouse, raising your children, submitting to the elders. Whatever you do, in word and deed, do it all uh, in the name of the Lord. And now, big question, but why? Why? And he gives you the answer, because you're giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you owe any gratitude to God the Father? Rhetorical question. Yes, you do. Regardless of whether or not you are a Christian today, 
you still owe a lot to the Father. You still owe gratitude and thanks to Him. And how do I do that? How can I thank God? And if we were left to our own devices, we would puzzle for our entire lifetimes and never figure out what a good way to say thank you is. But we don't have to do that. Because God tells us through Paul's writing, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, and that will be giving thanks to the Father through him. If you just do that, we don't have time to read it, but Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, is when Jesus commissions the 72 to go out and to, to just go out and evangelize, go out and teach, go out and talk to people, go out to heal people, take care of problems. And when they return, what do they say? Wait a minute, what is that? Oh, I went too far. Ignore that. Whoops, there we go. When they return, what do they say? Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. I think about what David said a moment ago. We trust God to resurrect us. You don't think he could take care of a few demons? Of course he could. God, Jesus had given them the authority and protection for their task, but that's not our task. We're not going out and, and exercising demons. We aren't healing the masses, and we're not performing any miracles at all. What do we do? We teach the gospel. We worship. We serve in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. James? We heal those who are crippled by sin and the false doctrine and false understanding and misunderstanding who God is. We don't heal the cripple that's laying there lame, but we heal cripples when we talk to them about God. And we heal ourselves, who also can be crippled by sin. Very good. Yeah, our healing is not, we're not offering physical healing. We're offering something much more important. We're offering greater works than those. Remember when Jesus healed the paralytic who had been um, let down through the ceiling tiles? And Jesus said, rise and walk, and everyone freaked out. No, no. Jesus didn't say rise and walk. What did he say first? Your sins are forgiven. And they were like, who can do that? And he says, rise and walk. He says, what's more, what's more important? What's more powerful than that? Well, for them and the very temporal understanding, they looked at it and said, well, if he can make a guy rise and walk, they're like, who can? I will guarantee you that that crippled person that was low, lowered down through the ceiling. Looking back in hindsight, what was more important to you that Jesus said to you? Rise and walk or your sins are forgiven? Amen. Your sins are forgiven. That was more powerful. So that's James's point. We're not healing physical things. We're doing greater things. We're healing sin through the words of the Lord, through the power of Christ, in the authority of his name. That's what we get to do. And we can do that in our worship, we can do that with our relationships, we do that with our conversations, how we raise our children, et cetera, et cetera. Everything you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Any questions? You've got two minutes. Stephanie has a comment. When, <clears throat> excuse me. When we do something by the authority of Jesus or in his name, um, we, we have to have a knowledge of what he tells us to do. We have to be educated in his word. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we want to take that to someone that we feel is not living um, in the way they need to, before we admonish them, we need to think about how would Jesus admonish them, in which way, and you talked about that agape love. But a lot of times what predicates the change that we want to see in that person is the way we deliver the admonition. So if we deliver the admonition in a way that is not like Christ, even if we're speaking truth, if we speak it in such a way that turns them away, um, we may never get that opportunity again. Yeah, and I want to say something. You said, you know, we need to make sure we know what we're talking about. Have the knowledge first. I'll, I'll encourage you, um, and I say this a lot, lead with love. The first thing you learn about God is God is love. So that's the first thing you know. And so the first thing when you encounter someone who's in sin and not living the way that they should or, or whatever, Lead with love. That's your primary. Let them understand that you love them, that you care about them, that God loves them, he cares about them. And that correction of behavior becomes a lot easier when they want to, and they're not doing it because you are chastising them or they don't want to hear it anymore. 
when their heart move, wants to move toward God, that's how that happens. And I think Stephanie's, Stephanie's talking about that, that that is accomplished in how we deliver the message, and we deliver it with our love and our concern for them. All right, thank you very much. Lesson 3.4 on Wednesday. Jim will have that one for you.